go ahead and play a game would you rather reform edition oh man you're gonna get me in so much trouble for this <laughs> would you rather meet the apostle john or the apostle paul oh man no pressure yeah <laughs> well just one to just meet one today on this podcast it would be the apostle john nice you'd be like man like can you tell me about revelation man like how was that Woo woo! Welcome to Bible Theory, homie. Taking the church to the streets, homie. See what? Hey, welcome back. Thank you so much for joining us once again at Bible Theory Podcast. If you have not, please go ahead and listen to the first two episodes of this season is solely on Presbyterianism, not just Calvinism, not just, um, you know, Reformed distinctives. Um, Bible Theory talks about ecclesiology from a Reformed perspective, but this season we are hitting hard, drilling into Presbyterianism and what it is, uh, the ins and outs, and we're bringing on different pastors theologians, authors to come on and to help us investigate this together. So hopefully you've been encouraged. If you have not, go back and listen to the first two with uh, Jeremy Collins. We investigated a little bit on the EPC, just a little bit about that, the differences between the EPC and the PCA. So that was fun. And then we talked to Dr. Aquila about the basic nuts and bolts of Presbyterianism. And now we're going to get into something real, real special. We're going to get into a church document called the Westminster Confession of Faith. Hashtag 1646. Or 1788, Jesse. <laughs> or 1984. No, I was playing. <laughs> <laughs> So uh, real quick, uh, Pastor Zach, why, why don't you um, introduce yourself? Uh, let us know who you are and what you do. Well, my name's Zachary Groff. I'm the pastor at Antioch Presbyterian Church, a congregation of the Presbyterian Church in America, or PCA. Uh, we're located in Woodruff, South Carolina, and we're actually a charter congregation of the PCA. That means that we came out of the old Presbyterian Church in the United States in 1973, 50 years ago, the other congregation congregations that made up that initial group of churches that uh, founded the PCA. And uh, what's interesting about our church, or well, that's one thing that's interesting, another interesting historical bit is a couple of years ago, uh, we were approached by the pastor and elders at the time and asked to basically replant the church while retaining the heritage that we've inherited here. And so we've kept the name, we've kept the history, we're celebrating what's going on here. We are actually a mission work of our presbytery with elders bar from other local churches. This is a beautiful expression of Presbyterianism at a regional level. And we've been working at reorganizing this little church. In addition to my labors here as a pastor, I also serve as editor for a website called Presbyterian Polity. You can find that at pcapolity.com. And I'm the managing editor serving alongside of general editor Chris Caldwell of the Confessional Presbyterian Journal, which is an academic peer-reviewed journal put out by Greenville Presbyterian Theological Seminary. Speaking of which, I'm I'm a I'm an affectionate alumnus of Greenville Seminary and nice. also of Temple University up in Philadelphia, where I'm originally from. And I am the Temple. father of <laughs> yeah, that's right, Temple Go Owls. And uh, I am uh, the father of six children and a uh, husband of one wife now of 13 years. Uh, my dear wife Jocelyn and our kids and I. One wife is here. important. <laughs> one wife is very important. <laughs> I'd be, I would not be a minister of the BCA if that was not the case, or if I had more than one wife, so to speak. <laughs> but we are delighted to be here at Antioch, and I'm really glad to be on your program tonight, Jesse. Thank you. Yeah, thank invitation. you so much for your flexibility, and thank you for coming on to share some of this, you know, insights about this document. All right. For those who don't know, you can support the show by uh, buying me a coffee. Buying me a coffee is one way to keep this stream going. Everything I do is by myself and to the glory of God. But go ahead, use your phone and scan this QR code there and it will take you to my um, page on buy me a coffee and a couple bucks. Even if it's $1, $2, $3, you know how much a cup of coffee costs nowadays. That will go directly to fund the show. I did this with Dr. Aquila. I threw I threw him some cool Presbyterian jokes, and then with uh, Pastor Jeremy, uh, we th we uh, I think we played some um, reform trivia. I think we did, and then now I would like to do something different with you. And let's go ahead and play a game. Would you rather reform edition? Oh man, you're gonna get me in so much trouble for this. <laughs> 
Would you rather meet the Apostle John or the Apostle Paul? Oh, man. No pressure. Yeah. <laughs> well, Jesse, I'm going to meet both of them in glory, and I look forward to that as we yes. worship the Savior together. But if I had to pick just one to just meet one. today on this podcast, it would be the Apostle John. Nice. You'd be like, man, like, can you tell me about Revelation, man? Like, how was that? <laughs> hey, we got the next best thing coming to Greenville, South Carolina in a couple weeks with Greg Beal, who's going to be doing a two-day seminar on unlocking or keys to unlocking uh, Revelation. Is speaking. that GK Beal? Oh, yeah. Yeah, he's yeah, yeah. I had him on my podcast in season two, I think. Oh, nice. Yeah, yeah. yeah we talked about the kingdom and the mission, the temple and all that. Oh, yeah. Yeah, yeah. All right, next question. Would you rather be stranded on the island with an Anabaptist? Baptist or Roman Catholic priest? Oh, man. <laughs> there are varieties, but with this one, let's just keep it generic. <laughs> okay. <laughs> well, if I had to pick just one, I think I would pick an Anabaptist because my last name is Groff. That's a historically Mennonite surname. I have a long Anabaptist heritage uh, behind me in my, in, my, uh, in my ancestry. So I guess I'm picking Anabaptist. All right. Would you rather have tea with Martin Luther or have tea with John Calvin. As much as I love Dr. Luther, I'm going with John Calvin on this one, man. That's too easy. <laughs> All right, last one. One more. Would sure. you rather go back in time to help John Knox clean his horse or visit the barbershop where Martin Luther got his haircut? Man, that's so random. Well, since there's no guarantee that I'd be at that barbershop at the same time as Dr. Luther, I guess I'm going to go for the guaranteed meeting with John Knox and clean the horse with him. <laughs> you like, hey, laddie, go pick up. <laughs> go do this. <laughs> yeah, hey, laddie, go get the horse for me. <laughs> So here in the first two episodes, we um, people have been mentioning this document, Westminster Confession of Faith. Westminster this, West, West, West of that. Let's get to that. What is the Westminster Confession of Faith? What is it? Who wrote it? Well, Jesse, if I had to describe the Westminster Confession of Faith based in, in, in one word, I would say it's a creed. To expand on that a little bit, it's a statement of faith. A lot of churches will have a statement of faith posted on their website, and the Westminster Confession of Faith is, is basically a very detailed version of that. It's a statement of faith drafted uh, over 300 50 years ago, and it was drafted with succinctness in mind, as well as precision, uh, seeking to be faithful to the scriptures and how it expressed and summarized the Christian faith. The men who prepared it in terms of asking, you know, who wrote this document, who provided us with this statement of faith, they were convened in the 1640s as the Westminster Assembly, specifically from about 1643 to 1653 at Westminster Abbey. That's where the name comes from. It's a famous church church building in uh, London, to put it a bit simply. And uh, it's actually where the coronation took place for King Charles III recently. That was on the news. And uh, they were convened at the height of the English Civil War. That's a very important detail. I don't know that we'll get into all the all the ins and outs of that, but that's important to note. The men who made up the assembly primarily was made up of Church of England ministers at the time, 121 ministers of various persuasions, Presbyterian, Congregationalist, and Episcopalian or Anglican. And um, in addition to the ministers, they had 30 what was called lay assessors, 10 noblemen and 20 commoners um, who were there to basically assess and track the progress of the assembly. But perhaps more significant than any of those members of the assembly were six non-voting commissioners drawn from the Church of Scotland. And though these men didn't have a vote, they were very vocal on floor debate and they exerted great and, and really good influence over the proceedings of the assembly. They were debating theology, talking about church and doctrine, family life in the church as well as outside the church. Was it was there like a like a specific deadline perhaps that they had to meet? Was there well, any like hmm. you know political pressure perhaps to to get it done faster or? Well, a lot of the English Civil War, or this I should say, the English Civil War had a very strong and evident religious dimension to it, and so there was. 
uh, political pressure, social pressure for them to come up with a document that would unite the kingdom. Uh, in fact, unite the three kingdoms of England, Scotland, and Wales under one established government and uh, one established church, I should say. And so in, in that respect, there was some pressure on them to produce something that would be usable and palatable to all the parties involved. Uh, but as far as their particular task and the deadlines that were assigned to them, it, it would be overly reductionistic to say that the only reason for which they convened was to produce a confession of faith. They also produced two catechisms that were to be used for the instruction of the youth and uh, the ministry and, and adults of the church, of what would become the Church of England as constituted after the production of these creedal statements. They were also tasked with producing a directory for worship and a uh, and even a directory for family worship, which they I, I believe they produced. Wow. And so there were a number of documents that they ended up putting out, uh, the confession of faith being the one that was to be authoritative in terms of uh, setting the doctrinal standard for the church. So um, forgive me, I, I don't know off the top of my head, particular dates and deadlines. Uh, you could consult the work of historians of the assembly, such as um, Beveridge and Van Dixhorn more recently, and, and others. Um, needless to say, being at the height of the English Civil War, there was certainly a lot of pressure and urgency around their task. Yeah, I could imagine writing stuff down when people are getting shot out, shot up outside kind of thing. Oh, um, I don't know if it was if it was right <laughs> at, at the threshold of the of Westminster <laughs> Abbey, but um, they were certainly receiving reports <laughs> of battles and, and, and it's like the and, Presbyterian and Compton. Compton. It's like pop. <laughs> <laughs> Well, that that would be that would be very bad. <laughs> So it sounds like there's some type of goal for this document. You know, you said it was to unite the three kingdoms. Now, did it unite the three kingdoms? Like the goal, was it successful in your opinion or historically looking back at it now? Politically, I think we have to recognize that it was a failure. It, it did not have a lasting bonding effect on the three kingdoms wow. or on uh, the religious establishment. In fact, with the restoration of Charles II to the throne, the West Mr. Confession of Faith and, and attending documents were pretty much thrown out. They they no longer had any constitutional or doctrinal basis, at least in the Church of England. Now, the Church of Scotland retained those documents. And even to this day, uh, the Church of Scotland refers to them as confessional documents for the Church. Now, the modern Church of Scotland, sadly, has all but apostatized in its entirety. It's much like the mainline Presbyterian Church in the United States of America, or PCUSA, not really really holding to the confession, but there are confessional churches, not only in Scotland, but even mm -hmm. around the world that use this document as their statement of faith. My church, the PCA, is uh, is one example, as well as other American Presbyterian churches, such as the Associate Reformed Presbyterian Church, the Orthodox Presbyterian Church, other smaller Presbyterian denominations. You mentioned the Evangelical Presbyterian Church. They have adopted the Westminster Confession of Faith, though revised uh, for their purposes. And and uh, though I would say each of these churches um, have adopted different versions of the Westminster Confession of Faith, all of us hold in common a respect for, a regard for, and actually really a lot of overlap between our versions for this document. So theologically, ecclesiologically, I refuse to say it was a failure. Politically, perhaps it did not accomplish the ends for which it was conceived, but religiously, since the mid-17th century, this this document has been an amazing blessing to the church and to many individuals, myself included in that number. It seems like they put in all this work, all this effort, time, you know, sacrifice perhaps, and then to, to get it swept away and swept under the rug or dismissed, it seems, it, yeah, it seems to me to be very political. It's political, obviously. Well, it certainly was, Jesse. The Church of England ended up throwing it out, and I should say King Charles II yeah. ended up throwing it out in order to make room for a more hierarchical form of church government known as prelacy or Episcopalianism. It resembles in much greater measure the old Roman Catholic papistical form of church government with somebody at the head of the church mm -hmm. and then underneath him, bishops and, and archbishops and cardinals and all these different offices all the way down to the, the parish priest and the deacons within a diocese. 
psoriasis. And wow. and so if I've misstated that, please forgive me for our Anglican and Episcopalian <laughs> listeners. But um, the point of the matter is that in order for King Charles II to exert the, the maximum amount of power over the Church of England, he believed he needed a hierarchical church government that terminated upon him as head of the English church. And even to this day, that the nominal head of the English church is recognized to be King Charles III, at least here on earth. Now, I do believe they 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 proclaim Christ as ultimate head, but it, you notice the way they articulate this would be very different than how yeah. us Presbyterians do. We do not recognize an earthly vicar of Christ. Rather, we just recognize one head of the church that is the Lord Jesus Christ, our Savior, he who purchased us at the price of his blood. No other man can lay claim to that exalted position in his church. And so that, that I think, it may explain some of the political theology behind the uh, rejection of the Westminster Confession of Faith as a statement of faith in the Church of England, at least in the 17th century. Let's go ahead and ask everybody's favorite question, and that is, are there any weak points to the Westminster Confession of Faith? Is there any weaknesses, mm. weak chapters, you know, like, if it's so great, there's got to be a, like some kind of chink, kink in his armor or something. Yeah, yeah, I understand what you're saying. Well, some people claim that the Westminster Confession of Faith, and usually they lump in the catechisms along with it, are cold, sterile theology, overly strict, something of a straight jacket. And, you know, that may be an argument that people can make, but I've not really heard it made cogently or in a convincing way myself. You need to understand I'm a very committed Presbyterian at this point, Jesse. So yeah. I have a high regard for the standards. But to give you an example, I've heard even at least one minister in my own denomination make the claim that uh, the Westminster Confession of Faith's presentation of the perspicuity of Scripture is overly restrictive and, and too confident. And and that, you know, the the degree of precision demanded by what's called strict subscription to our standards is even going beyond the Bible. And I needless to say, I, I think that's incorrect. If that is sincerely your view, then I would encourage you to go to a denomination that has a broader, perhaps less detailed statement of faith to which you can subscribe your name um, wholeheartedly. Now, there are some others, believe it or not, if you look at the history of Presbyterianism, there are some others who believe that it's too loose at certain points points, that it leaves wow. too much of, a, of an open question to matters such as uh, your position on the millennium, whether you're pre, post, or amillennial. There are others who claim that it's too open-handed about the lapsarian debate, whether you're supra or infra lapsarian in terms of the order of the decrees of God. And, and there are even others who would wish to see a, a more strong or strict expression of commitment to exclusive psalmody in the Westminster standards. Uh, now, those, those kinds of arguments Arguments are made very infrequently. Uh, they are few and far between, but you do hear them every once in a while. I think the the main point of attack that people make on the standards is that it's, or on the confession, I should say, is that it's it's lacking in a pastoral touch and that it's overly strict. Um, and then if you look at the history of the revisions to the standards, particularly here in America, but also in Scotland with the declaratory statement of the late 19th century, obviously at those times of revision, uh, there were arguments made and successfully in these cases, that there was a particular weakness that needed to be addressed in the confession. I think most famously in a, in here in America, there was a revision in 1788 to which I alluded, which changed chapter 23, paragraph three on the civil magistrate, but also in the early 20th century, what a lot of people don't realize, and I don't know, maybe Jeremy uh, talked about this, there is a, a further revision in the Northern Presbyterian Church to include a chapter on the Holy Spirit and to add a chapter on world world missions. And that, that would be the fundamental difference or the primary difference between the Westminster Confession as adopted by the EPC and the Westminster Confession as adopted by the PCA and the OPC. Those uh, identifications of possible weaknesses and the successful arguments in favor of revision throughout history certainly um, would add a historical dimension to the answer to your question. Perhaps you got more than you bargained for. But for my <laughs> part, Jesse, I have no plans to propose any revision revisions to the Westminster yeah, um, standards as adopted by the PCA. I, I don't see any pressing or clear, obvious weaknesses myself. 
Here's another question for you. I'm 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 sure. interested to hear your thoughts. Like, how much was the West the West West a product of the Reformation versus just an English production? That's a great question, and it's one that I've been pondering this year as I've been reading through Richard Muller's four volume set on post Reformation Reform dogmatics. That's basically a, a fancy title saying um, the theology of the Reformation after that initial generation of reformers. So, like, what happens from you know fifty 1560-ish up until, you know, the Enlightenment. What What is the development of theology? And one of the big developments is the production of a number of confessions of faith, such as the First and Second Helvetic, uh, the Gallican Confession of Faith, of course, the Scots Confession in, in 1560, and then really is seen as a high point is the Westminster Confession of Faith in the 1640s. And then following after that, a number of confessions based upon it, the Savoy uh, Declaration, and then the London Bap the Second London Baptist Confession. As we look Look at all these. It is good to ask, you know, where did this come from? Was this just an English thing or was it a Reformation thing? And the answer is, though the unique political situation in England sparked the or inspired, I should say, the, the convention of the Westminster Assembly, it was a thoroughgoing Reformation document. It was intended to draw from the gains of the Reformation in this post-Reformation reformed scholastic period to come up with with a more robust uh, statement of faith than what the Church of England currently had in the 39 articles. And so if I was giving a simple answer to your question, I would just say this is a Reformation document. It's by no means uh, simply an English document. If you just put the, the Westminster Confession of Faith alongside the, the Belgic Confession, for example, you will see a great deal of similarity. If you put it up against the Second Helvetic Confession, which is uh, Helvetus is the Latin term for Switzerland. It's basically the Confession of of the Swiss churches of the time, you'll see a lot of commonality. Even just within the, the book of confessions of the period, you'll see a lot of overlap. And then certainly if you expand the lens a little bit and consider the different systematic theologies that were being produced, put the confession of faith kind of next to Calvin's Institutes, for example, or Bullinger's Decades, or uh, or the work of, of later post-Reformation Reformed scholastics who were writing at, at that time, you'll see a lot of influence upon the work of the Westminster Assembly. These were men who were not only literate, but were engaged in the international dialogue and discussion of uh, uh, Reformed theology in response to Anabaptists and Roman Catholics and then Lutherans. And then, um, of course, really right around this time, even a little bit later on, Socinians and then radical rationalists in the next century. And the Westminster Confession ended up being a powerful instrument, both in polemics, but also in positive theology and in discipleship. And so in the Westminster Confession, Confession of Faith, I believe, represents the very best that the that the period of high orthodoxy, high Protestant orthodoxy, has to offer us. Um, and it's not restricted to simply uh, the English Reformation, but it really belongs to the Reformation as a whole. I think you make a lot of sense. Um, I was reading John Calvin's Catechism, and I was, you know, blown away by the first question: um, "What is the chief end of man?" Basically, mm. and I was like, it, "It's basically what is the chief end of man?" Just with the ex like a couple extra words added to it. They basically almost copyrighted infringement because they, they they took that same question and they put it in the catechism. And I was like, that's that's so interesting how they did that. Yeah, we're, we're standing on the shoulders of giants, to borrow absolutely. a phrase from Isaac Newton. And that's that's absolutely the case in theology. Uh, and, and I think too often we want to pick up our Bibles and, and say, thus saith the Lord, when really we mean thus saith me and what I believe, at what this document is saying, and really having a, an historical perspective to identify both the strengths and the weaknesses of our forebears in the theological enterprise. Um, having that historical perspective is crucially important. I mean, that's why I'm reading through Muller's four volume work on historical theology is to, wow. to make me a better theologian so I can handle God's word more effectively with, with greater confidence and knowing the kinds of pitfalls that those who came before us fell into, as well as the kinds of problems that uh, our faithful forefathers addressed and, and answered with biblical argumentation. And so uh, the Westminster Confession is still one of the, the most 
powerful tools for confidently appealing to what's called the analogy of faith, the analogia fide, or the analogy of scripture, where it's one of the core principles of, of our hermeneutics. It's expressed in chapter one of the confession that in, in whenever we come up against a hard passage or a difficult interpretation, we compare it to clearer passages of scripture. Mm -hmm. That means we have to have a handle on the whole counsel of God. That's where biblical theology is very useful, giving us the great themes and motifs of scripture so we can understand the Bible, not just with greater depth of insight, but also with greater confidence that we, in fact, are standing on solid ground on that solid principle of knowing theology, which is the word of God itself. That's very interesting. You know, wh when you read uh, Calvin's Institutes, he starts off with the knowledge of God. And then like you read the West West and it starts off with the scriptures. Yeah. The Holy scriptures. Is there a reason why is they start off a little differently? Well, yes and, and no. So right. basically right. there are the two different documents are accomplishing different ends. But one of the big patterns you see or developments you see in the post-Reformation period, that era after Calvin and Luther, well, I should say Luther and Calvin pass from the scene and, and hand the baton off to the next generation, is you see a more precise definition of what's called the principia of theology, the, the foundational or fundamental principles of theology. And basically, the theologians of that era identify two principia. That's the plural of principium in Latin. The first principium is the Percimpium ascendi theologiae, that is the, the principle of essential theology or the substance of theology, and that's God himself. But we as mere creatures cannot peer into, directly peer into the very being of God. Does that make sense? Yes, because we'll and, burn. <laughs> and so, and so, yeah, yeah, exactly. We'd be consumed. It, it'd, be like, it'd be like the, the lost ark. <laughs> the <ra> <laughs> Yep. Yep. Sure. That's fine. Um, <laughs> and so you, you have that problem. And so what is our starting point for knowing God then? Well, his self-revelation. And that brings us to the second principium of theology, the principium uh, cognoscendi theologiae, basically the principle, the foundational principle of knowing theology, of knowing God himself. And that's his word to us. And so the Westminster divines are picking up on that and they're not contradicting Calvin. They're not... Uh, um, going beyond Calvin, I would say they're building upon Calvin by spelling out, even in their confessional document, that uh, locus or head of theology, the theology of scripture or the doctrine of scripture. Before we can begin to describe God himself as he's revealed himself to us, we need to understand basically what it is we need in order to behold God. And, and we need uh, his self-revelation accommodated to us. And and Calvin talks a great deal about accommodation in, in even the Institutes. Speaking of God, uh, he uses a very memorable picture. It's a beautiful picture. Uh, as a father lisping to his children, kind of that, that baby talk that, mm -hmm. that we use to express our love for our babies before they can understand understand words, yeah. uh, but they can understand these almost meaningless to us uh, expressions of devotion and love and, and commitment to our babies, uh, which really build up their trust in us. And so God, in, in like manner, accommodates himself to us that we might know something of his love, of his goodness, as well as of his power and his justice and his truth, which we behold in creation around us. And so um, it's at the end of the day, an epistemological matter, philosophy, that's the, phrase, the term used to describe, you know, how how we know what we know, and then um, and then you have the metaphysical issues, basically what is the case. Well, in theology, we begin with our way of knowing God, and then and then we can describe based on what's expressed to us, what's revealed to us, uh, what we can know about God. So I think it's appropriate that the Westminster divines start with the how we know before they get into, uh, in greater detail, the what we know. I hope that makes sense, and that's yes. helpful. Deep stuff. If you did not catch that, rewind it. And rewind it. <laughs> <laughs> yeah. Or, or you can find someone who can express it more effectively than I can. But I hope that's helpful. No, it's fine. It was great. Uh you know, going going back to that state question or that political question, you know, because it seemed like the Westminster divines were working somewhat in concert or in league with the state and you know how is this relationship can be explained or understood from an american radicalization secular secular version of that hmm. understanding of a relationship between church and state because here in america we have this radical understanding that that the state is like separated so much so that the state does kind of swallow up the church yep. <laughs> they're giving a thumbs up on facebook back in the 1600s <laughs> 
<laughs> so if we if we go back into the annals of church history, uh, we see that the Council of Nicaea was convened by the emperor. Um, that is Emperor Constantine. He was a secular authority, but he called for a synod or a, a council to resolve a religious question that was basically tearing his empire apart. Um, the question on the, the person and essence of Christ, our Lord, and and his and the union of his two natures. And we have the the Nicene Creed and the Apostles' Creed recognize those as biblically faithful summaries of of true doctrine that we hold fast to even today, uh, at least Orthodox churches. By that, I mean theologically Orthodox, not merely Greek and Russian Orthodox, you know. So flash forward to the 17th century, what do we have? Well, we have parliament, which is a secular authority, convening a religious assembly, a synod or a council, if you will, to resolve uh, a spiritual doctrinal problem. And is that appropriate? Can we imagine today President Biden issuing an executive <laughs> order to convene um, the Presbyterian and Reformed churches in the United States of America to produce a document? an American confession of faith. Can we imagine um, the Senate and Congress calling for a Congress of all American churches to resolve some kind of spiritual crisis or difficulty? No, we can't imagine that at all all there'll be pandemonium um, in the streets yeah that that would be so foreign to us actually what i think would happen jesse if if that did happen i think it would pass by the american public as irrelevant actually okay. the state does convene religious leaders for different you know advisory councils which are all but toothless and have absolutely no significance to anything and mm -hmm. nobody even really notices or puts you up might a be buff. that's a, that, that's a darker <laughs> take but you 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 know you know what you you might be right <laughs> hey i'm from philly man i i'm pretty cynical on that kind of stuff that's but, pretty pessimistic um, in I, philadelphia <laughs> hey what, what can i say um but in any case when we when we look at the Westminster Confession of Faith, I already mentioned chapter 23. The, the pertinent section is chapter 23, paragraph 3. Here we see the, the playing out of that relationship between church and state within the Presbyterian consciousness, what we believe to be uh, biblical, and how that changes over time, particularly in different political environments and different constitutional arrangements. For the Westminster divines, they were operating in a context where they could not imagine a disestablished or free church. They were all ministers in an established church. That is a church with government sanction and sponsorship. That's what they figured would continue to be the case. And really, it's not until subsequent history where you have the emergence of free churches in the English-speaking world, and then whole movements committed to disestablishmentarianism, and then anti-disestablishmentarianism for all kinds of different reasons that we don't have time to get into, and I don't have expertise really to speak uh, with any authority on. But but what we see here in this um, in this section is really two fundamentally, or not fundamentally, I should say, two very different applications of perhaps common principles. Let me read uh, these paragraphs for you. In yes. 1646, the Westminster Confession of Faith, chapter 23, paragraph 3, reads as follows, quote, the civil magistrate may not assume to himself the administration of the word and sacraments or the powers of the keys of the kingdom of heaven. And that is common, in common, that part is in common with the American revision of 1788. Uh, but the 1646 continues, yet he has authority and it is his duty to take order that unity and peace be preserved in the church that the truth of god be kept pure and entire that all blasphemies and heresies be suppressed all corruptions and abuses in worship and discipline prevented or reformed and all the ordinances of god duly settled administered and observed for the better effecting whereof he has power to call synods to be present at them and to provide that whatsoever is transacted in them be according to the mind god basically the civil magistrate is given oversight over the theological deliberations of the church. That's how that's expressed. And he here, is here. Oh, I'm sorry to interrupt here yep. on the OPC website, the Westminster Confession here, this version on chapter 23, the same section, it says um, the second sentence, I think it says yet as nursing fathers, it is the duty of civil magistrates to protect the church of our common Lord right there. Is, is, that sounds a little different from it's it's very different. And we actually have to back up a clause to capture okay. the full difference. So if we 
okay. look at the revised version of the Westminster Standards, we have this. Civil magistrates may not assume to themselves the administration of the word and sacraments or the power of the keys of the kingdom of heaven. That much is the same, but notice. Or, in the least, interfere in matters of faith. That yep. cuts directly against everything else in the historic 1646 confession. And then we continue, yet as nursing fathers, it is the duty of civil magistrates to protect the church of our common Lord without giving the preference to any denomination of Christians above the rest in such a manner that all ecclesiastical persons, whatever, shall enjoy the full, free, and unquestioned liberty of discharging every part of their sacred functions without violence or danger. And as Jesus Christ has appointed a regular government and discipline in his church, no law of any commonwealth should interfere with with, let or hinder the due exercise thereof among the voluntary members of any denomination of Christians according to their own profession and belief. It is the duty of civil magistrates to protect the person and good name of all their people in such an effectual manner as that no person be suffered, either upon pretense of religion or infidelity, to offer any indignity, violence, abuse, or injury to any other person whatsoever, and to take order that all religious and ecclesiastical assemblies be held without molestation or disturbance. Ooh. Basically, the picture here of the civil magistrate is not as some kind of Christian prince advancing the cause of the right. church within the commonwealth, but rather as an impartial, yes, as an impartial ruler who is fencing off the church so that it can operate according to God's uh, divinely appointed design in his word. Basically, the civil magistrate is to protect the religious liberty of the church, not to worship as he thinks they should worship, but to worship as God. God would have them to worship according to his word. Now, the, the big question mark in this revision is that line about without giving the preference to any denomination of Christians above the rest in such a manner that all ecclesiastical persons, whatever, shall enjoy the full, free, and unquestioned liberty of discharging every part of their sacred functions. So basically, the civil magistrate is said, based on our confession of faith, to protect the church and needs to have some kind of definition that he uses to distinguish Christians from everyone else. So there is... Uh, there is that question, okay, how does the civil magistrate determine that spiritual, that theological question? And then you get down into the second half of the of the paragraph as it's revised, and you see that it's really putting forward a, a, a more robust picture of religious liberty, where nobody is compelling anybody else by the power of the sword to make a particular confession of faith. And so that is to say that, you know, uh, a, a Christian army cannot come into America and force every non-Christian Christian to make a creedal statement in order to be enrolled in the ranks of the church. There's no compulsion in religion, so to speak. That's a very important value enshrined in our constitution. Really, I think what this reflects is the separation of church and state as it was originally conceived to right. protect the church, it's not a to healthy rob version of it. Yes, it's a healthy version. This isn't designed to rob the state of Christian influence or to prevent Christians from influencing the state as Christians with Christian values. Of course, Yes. We don't, we don't want to prohibit that as, insofar as, as the state um, reflects Christian values. That's for the good of everybody. But this is uh, strictly limiting the state to be the state so that the church can then be the church and uh, maintain a prophetic voice in society as well as to maintain right worship according to God's word. I think that the, the confession as revised is more helpful to us and also more true to scripture. But I have dear brothers and friends who disagree with me and who hold to the confession as originally drafted and adopted in 1646. In fact, the Reformed Presbyterian Church in North America, the Associate Reformed Presbyterian Church in our country, and some of the smaller Presbyterian churches in, in our country all would hold to the confession as originally adopted, as, as would the, the Free Presbyterian Church in Scotland and, and other bodies around the world. So I don't think it's worth it to get bogged down in this, but this is a significant difference between the American Presbyterian tradition and then also and then the Scottish Presbyterian tradition uh, to put it yeah. if we can Every, everything it. you just said it feels like that's not our relationship right now between the church and the government and and the state it, it, it feels like our relationship with the government is thin ice walking on eggshells uh, like you know I better not see you after school otherwise you know I'm gonna steal your lunch money I'm gonna steal yeah. your lunch money you know what I mean like you know Jesse the reality is we have a good in this we do have um, a good yeah we have amazing tax breaks for churches of all stripes including charlatans who can yeah. claim to be a church but really abuse the privilege we have such an amazing degree
degree of religious liberty where I can sit here in a church building without really any reasonable fear of being attacked. And we have brothers and sisters in Nigeria and East Africa and throughout the Muslim world in the Far East, um, of course, in South Asia, and, and even now in Canada and Australia who don't have those assurances, who, who don't necessarily have that access to uh, public spaces, to their own property, to congregate and to gather. And um, I, I refuse to believe that we have it, that we have any real marginal distress in our country. Do we have problems? Yes. Do I fear that we will lose our liberties and advantages? Yes, I am concerned. But I think that if we're going to be sober in analyzing the situation, we need to recognize that we still got it really good. And okay, so so maybe I said it wrong. Maybe our, it sounds like our our role um, at the table is maybe not as big as as it as it should be. Perhaps is that a better way of saying it? Like I would agree with you that our our, our condition in the United States or in the Western world, uh, well, particular here, is really nice and cushy yeah. and luxury and protected. But you know, it seems like the government is not giving a, a fair shake to authentic Orthodox Christians and giving mm -hmm. them like a bigger role at the table to play. Well, right? I'm not sure. I'm not sure what greater role we can have than we already have. There there really is no provision in our constitution for privileged position for any one religious sect. Now, obviously, mm -hmm. right. um, there is no neutrality in politics or in religion or in worldviews or or metaphysical commitments, and everybody has them. And you you go into the halls of power, and certainly the, the overriding uh, view of what makes life good for those who live it and what is the purpose of the state and what is the purpose of the church or whatever is not our view. And that's right. obvious. That being said, we have, I think, a great deal of influence and voice as Orthodox Christians and particularly as Reformed Christians that a lot of groups don't have. There is certainly a, a higher profile to, let's say, just the Presbyterian Church in America than there is for, let's say, the Amish community or the Jehovah's Witness community, both of which have more people people than we have. And so I, I think that there's a lot of reason to be encouraged, though we shouldn't be triumphalistic. And I'm certainly not an advocate for what is being called Christian nationalism uh, on social media anyway. And so, you know, I would say that uh, we have every reason to be optimistic and energetic in publishing the gospel as, as, as far and wide as we can. And we have a lot of tools at our disposal to do that freely and without hindrance if we would but commit our resources to doing that. There's a common saying in the PCA that we punch out, we punch, you know, above our weight class. And um, and I think that's true. I, I think we do have an outsized uh, influence and voice on, on matters of social import. Now, one thing I think that we do need to be chastened on is our worldliness, not just in mm. the PCA, but in evangelicalism. We are so preoccupied with consuming entertainment culture in this country and calling it cultural engagement. Uh, guys, mm. let's just call it like it is. We just like the junk food that everybody else is eating. And we want to, you know, justify ourselves by calling it cultural engagement or whatever. I'm just as guilty as anyone else, you know, in terms of being being into movies and books and music that right. really has no lasting value or worth uh, just to be entertained or sports or whatever. So anyway, I, I think if if we need to chasten ourselves in anything or complain about anything, that should be it is, you know, why, why, oh, why do we not have a better influence upon the, mm -hmm. the cultural produce, if you will, of our society. And and we just sit here consuming the poison that gets shoved down our throats from, from Hollywood and, and New York and wherever yeah. else. That being said, Jesse, I sympathize with everything you said. And certainly I wish that we had a more righteous civil magistrate in this country. And and you know, I, I know I know the frustrations that a lot of guys are feeling because I share them, but I don't know that the answer is advocating for the emergence of a, some kind of Christian prince or or uh, some kind of legislated Christianity. I think I think really the church needs to be about the work of the church, which is sharing the gospel with our neighbors in our communities and publishing abroad the glad tidings of Christ's life, death, resurrection, and ascension to for the forgiveness of sins and the salvation of his people.
if you're a Baptist listening, just mm -hmm. to warn you, if, if our confession is so good and it, and it is good, why did the Baptist have to go on and make and recreate or make it, make their own when there is something so good already on the table, on the menu? Sure. That's, that's a great question, Jesse. And I mean, the, the easy answer is that, um, cause the Westminster confession of faith is not a Baptist document. I mean, it, it does not, it does not publish and advocate for believers only baptism. Um, but in order to understand where the Baptist version, basically, of this confession comes from, we need to go back in Baptist history. Uh, there are basically three three major theses for the emergence of Baptist church life and theology. One is called Baptist successionism, kind of to put it that way, or trail of blood. It's, it tries to chart believers' baptism and those who hold to it all the way back to uh, John the Baptist, not John the Presbyterian, they're quick to remind you, and then all the way through to the present day. The London Baptist Confession doesn't really have to do with that. And then there's a, a view of Baptist history that traces it from the Radical Reformation and uh, the Anabaptist movement, which came in the generation after Zwingli, and and really developed, I would I would say, in a mainstream way with uh, with the Mennonites in in the Rhineland in Western Germany, and then coming over here to the United States, or what was in the colonies, and and settling in Pennsylvania in large measure, and, and throughout Ohio, and then um, and then on down. Uh, that's that's another. That's another art, a thesis about where Baptists come from. And then the third one, which I think is the most compelling for understanding modern Baptist churches outside of those who are self-consciously Anabaptist, uh, modern Baptist churches like your Southern Baptist Convention and General Baptists and National Baptists and all of that really goes back to the uh, to Reformation England, to the post-Reformation era, to the 17th century. And then the emergence of general and particular Baptists, General Baptists adopting more of an Arminian theology to put it crassly, and then uh, generally seen as dissipating into um, successor movements and, and other kind of odd movements like the Quakers and the Shakers and, and, and a lot of those kinds of things. And then later on with actually the English Presbyterians uh, and the Latitudinarians getting lumped into and, and absorbed by uh, really the Unitarian movement, very sadly, in, during the Age of the Enlightenment. And that's the General Baptists. Now, the particular Baptists are the ones who give us the second London Baptist Confession. It's called the second because the first one was drafted in London in 1644, which, as you will note, was two years before the Westminster Confession of Faith. Um, I have not seen any compelling evidence to suggest that the first London Baptist Confession had any influence on the Westminster Confession of Faith, but there is obvious evidence and correspondence between the 1646 Westminster Confession and the 1689 London Baptist Confession, which would have been actually originally drafted in 1677 and then adopted uh, in its current Current form in 1689 with all of the, the full revisions. Now, why in the world did they do this? That's really getting down to the heart of your question. Why did they produce a confession of faith so similar to the Westminster Confession of Faith right. and yet different at various points? Well, there's something to the name Baptist that obviously explains it. And they wanted a Baptist version. But the underlying issue, Jesse, is a hermeneutical one. It has to do with how we read scripture and build out, flesh out our our theological system, um, our summaries of scripture and what it is God is telling us about who he is and what he would have us to do in his church. But first, let's kind of describe the, the similarities. And for this, I'm drawing from an essay by uh, Timothy George, who is a Baptist scholar, and he publishes an essay or a chapter called Baptists in the Westminster Confession in this book right here, The Westminster Confession into the 21st Century, Volume 1. This is a three-volume set that was released at the 350th anniversary anniversary of the Westminster Assembly. But basically, Dr. George traces out kind of the background of the Baptist movement, and then he points out to really four reasons, driving or overriding reasons, that the London uh, Baptist Confession, the Second London Baptist Confession, and what later became the Philadelphia Confession, because it was adopted in the New World in Philadelphia, why it's so similar to the Westminster Standards. Why didn't they just make up their own thing? Why did they produce such an obviously derivative document? Well, or the first reason of these four that Dr. George gives was because they really conceived of themselves sharing in the struggle that the that was part of just the Reformation, broadly uh, broadly speaking. These men, if you look at their preface in 1677, they actually explain why. But they really saw themselves as standing in a line descended from the Westminster divines, and between the two was the Congregationalist version of the Westminster Standard. 
standards, which was called the Savoy Declaration of 1658. And so the Baptists then come in and say, yes, we like all of that, except for these few points. And those are the only points we want to change because we want them to know that we're not all that different than they are. We're not a bunch of kooks and crazies. Okay. We're like, we're in this with them. The second reason the Baptists of 1677 and then later 1689 uh, wanted to show that they adopted a confession that was so similar was because they just wanted to show their solidarity uh, with the kind of reform theology set forth in Westminster Confession. Not only were they following a historical trajectory with the Savoy Declaration, but also they were showing their solidarity explicitly and even renewing that solidarity. The third reason they're so similar is because they, like the Westminster divines, appeal to scripture as the final arbiter in matters of religious controversy. And they liked how that was put in the Westminster standards, though there's going to be a significant difference that we'll highlight. And then fourth, the fourth reason is that they were deeply concerned to pass on their faith to the next generation. And one way of doing it is the production of confessions. And you know, passing on a faith that is tried and true is is obviously presents obvious advantages than uh, passing on something that's completely new or rearticulated. So those are the reasons why they're similar. Now, in terms of the differences, oh man, th th there are several. Most obvious being on sacraments that baptism is to be by immersion of adult believers only in the London Baptist Confession. Um, another big difference is a radical view of religious liberty. So that section of their confession of faith is very different than the Westminster Confession. Confession. They also, if you're looking closely in their section on the decrees of God, they put forward a, a softer version of predestination. So if you look at the Westminster Confession of Faith, we hold to a very strong and forward expression of double predestination, that God predestines some to everlasting life and predestines some to everlasting condemnation and death to display both his perfect mercy and his perfect justice, all for his glory. In the, London ba in the second London Baptist Confession, they take out that strong expression of God predestinating some to hell. They take that out and they they insert in its place a statement that actually resembles more so the canons of Dort of the early or earlier in the 16th or 17th century, which says that God passes over some. So rather than saying he actively predestines them to hell, it's rather, well, he doesn't choose them for eternal life. And you see how that's a slight nuance. It kind of softens the doctrine a bit, though. <clears throat> yeah. Fundamentally, it really it's is a softer the same landing. Thing. Yeah, yeah. I mean, it's it's not it's not commanding functionally. It, it really is the same thing. But then the most significant difference to my mind is I look at the two documents, and I'm no expert on Baptist theology. I'm barely an expert on Presbyterian theology. But when I look at the two documents, the biggest difference in and between the two is uh, their view on how to read Scripture and formulate theological propositions and systems in the Westminster. Confession of Faith in our opening chapter on Holy Scripture, we speak of what's called good and necessary consequence. And if I can recommend a book to you all, I recommend to you Dr. Ryan McGraw's book on the same title by Good and Necessary Consequence, where he speaks about this. But just to read this in the confession here, here we go. The whole, this is in paragraph six of chapter one, the whole counsel of God concerning all things necessary for his own glory, man's salvation, faith, and life is either expressly set down in Scripture or by God good and necessary consequence may be deduced from Scripture. What are some examples of this? The word Trinity, to describe God, to say God is Trinity, which we use in our Confession of Faith, which the Second London Baptist Confession uses. That word's found nowhere in Scripture, but we right. deduce it from the fact that we see that the Father is to be regarded and worshipped as God, the Son is to be regarded and worshipped as God, and the Spirit is to be regarded as worshipped as God. They share in one substance, equal in power and glory, but yet they are three Three distinct persons. The Son is not the Father. The Father is not the Son. Neither the Son nor the Father is a Spirit. The Spirit is not a manifestation of the Son or the Father. They are three distinct persons. They have their various operations. They are involved in all of them together. And yet, three persons, one God. We call that the Trinity. Another deduction is we serve communion to women. There's nowhere in Scripture that tells us to serve the Lord's Supper to female believers. And yet, we do. And another deduction, perhaps more famous and more controversial than, uh, than that last one is that we baptize children of believing parents, and that's household or covenant <laughs> baptism. There, That's not in the Second London Baptist Confession. Why not? Why don't they have the, that in there? Well, I would argue, ultimately, it's a hermeneutical issue, which then gives birth to an ecclesiological issue, which then gives birth to a sacramentological issue. It's a view of how we read scripture and formulate theology, which then affects how we understand what the church is and 
and is not. And that, of course, has direct bearing on how we administer sacraments according to Christ's institution. That is why Baptists produce their own document. And I hope I also explained, uh, using Dr. George's help, why it is the London Baptist Confession is so similar, or at least the second London Baptist Confession is so similar to the Westminster Standards. It's not because they were looking over our shoulder and copying it. I've seen the internet meme. It's funny. Okay, <laughs> I get it. You know, But it's because they had a high regard for the Westminster Confession of Faith. And though I think they were wrong to revise it the way they did, I can appreciate that our brothers have a high esteem for that which we hold in common. I'm going to recommend this whole season to one of my Baptist friends who's actually very open about Presbyterianism and Good. his congreg his congregation and his pastor is actually on the fence. And I think they're actually transitioning to Presbyterianism, although he does struggle <laughs> and he's learning. So funny expression to use. <laughs> he's transitioning. <laughs> now, that's the kind of transitioning that I support and fully endorse. <laughs> you know, I'll say this first. It's a joke. Baptists make great Presbyterians. That's the first thing. Anyone who becomes a Presbyterian, if, if the spirit's in it, you're going to be a great Presbyterian. Uh, the second thing I'll say is this. Submit yourself to God's word. Don't submit yourself to the teachings of men. Don't submit yourself to tradition. That's not what Presbyterians are asking you to do. We're asking you to study sincerely, earnestly, and, and, and with a tender heart. Study God's word and study the best of the, the expositors of God's word, particularly on the doctrines of the covenant, of how to read scripture, Scripture and of the church. If I can recommend to you just a couple of short books, if you haven't read John Murray, Christian Baptism, read it. It's very good, particularly when handling the issue of mode. I think that's a very helpful book. Read Pierre Marcel on infant baptism. I think that is a very helpful book. It's a bit more difficult to read. It was translated out of French, but again, Pierre Marcel and look it up in a biblical case for infant baptism. Read that book I mentioned to you before, Ryan McGraw's book by Good and Necessary consequence published by Reformation Heritage book it uh, or books it's it's a short book on a series that explores different parts of, of confessions of faith and then there's another book in that series that Dr. McGraw wrote called the Ark of Safety which explores that uh, statement in chapter 25 of our confession that says ordinarily there's no salvation outside the church the church is our Ark of Safety those two little books are very helpful for getting a, a handle on why really where these Presbyterian conclusions come from they don't just come they do not come from tradition mind you they come from a particular commitment to reading scripture and a com particular commitment to understanding what the church is according to scripture. And those two books, super helpful. I put them in the hands of everybody uh, with whom I have Man. this conversation. I'll go ahead and, and, I'll, really and, them, and then I'll drop the links of that, of those yeah. books down below. Oh yeah. Thank you, Jesse. If you really want to dive into covenant theology, you can read O. Palmer Robertson, Christ of the Covenants. That's very helpful. That has helped thousands of people with mm -hmm. covenant theology. You can look into, you know, Ligon Duncan's, uh, free RTS class on, on covenant theology. I think Dr. Duncan does a wonderful job explaining uh, different varieties of covenant theology. You can look at uh, Richard Belcher's book on covenant theology, which came out a couple of years ago, and then the big anthology of essays and articles by uh, RTS professors uh, just called Covenant Theology. I think it's edited by Guy Waters and, and a few other the professors there. All of those are helpful. But if you really want to dive into it, look up The Economy of the Covenants Between God and Man by Herman Witzi who uh, was part of the, the Dutch Second Reformation um, in that post-Reformation reform scholastic period. Uh, his work is definitive. If you really want to get a grip on a reformed understanding of the covenants, say if you're coming out of new covenant theology or coming out of progressive dispensationalism or coming out of uh, some other um, form of reformed Baptist covenant theology, look up Herman Witsius. Take take a close read. Take a serious read. Now, it's going to be demanding, but it's going to be worth it. And, um, and all of those other books I recommended are helpful. Uh, there's also a hard to find, but a little anthology of uh, lectures that were delivered at a Greenville Presbyterian Theological Seminary conference many years ago. And the book is just called The Covenants. I think it's edited by Dr. Joseph A. Piper and Dr. Nick Wilborn, C.N. Wilborn. If it's not Dr. Wilborn, then it would be Mr. Andy Wartman, who was a co-editor with Dr. Piper on that book. Again, very helpful, easy to digest. And, and all of those lectures are also online on Sermon Audio at Greenville Seminary Sermon Audio page. Uh, so I hope those are some helpful resources for you in terms of considering covenant theology and the difference between Presbyterians and Baptists. I'll go ahead and drop those links down below.
Let's go ahead and wrap this up real quick. I appreciate your time and thoughtfulness on this. It's really good. Take us to a 30,000 foot view on the Westminster Confession and its influence in the world today. What kind of influence is it having on, on the world right now? I want to start with one thing. I mean, we already talked a little bit about the political failure, but right. the, the what I call the ecclesiological triumph of the Westminster Confession of Faith. It is the statement of faith for innumerable congregations and denominations around the world in different versions, of course. But the first thing you need to understand about it and its influence, its continuing relevance to the world today is, and it's going to blow your mind, the Westminster Confession of Faith is not merely a Presbyterian document. It is a Christian document. It is a self-consciously Christian creed for Christians of all types. It is for your consideration, no matter what you are or profess to be, use the Westminster Confession of Faith to inform your theology, to challenge you, and to help you to understand what it means not just to be a Presbyterian, but what it means to be a Christian who believes in a sovereign and gracious God. Its influence today is really grounded on that fact, um, that it is a beautiful expression of biblical Christianity. Now, it is obviously Presbyterian, but that's only because those who drafted it and those who hold to it today believe that Presbyterianism is the Bible's picture for how Christ's church is to run, how it is to be governed. Here's a great book that I really enjoy, How Jesus Runs the Church by Guy Waters. Love gives that us, one. Yeah, gives us that picture of uh, Presbyterian church government is biblical church government. And he just published a, a much briefer book, Well-Ordered Living Well, which is more of a, a helpful introduction to the same basic principle. But if you want to get heady, see, I came prepared, Jesse. Yes, you want to get heady, check out this thing. But basically, that, that says, uh, Jus Divinum Regiminis Ecclesiastici, or the divine right of church government. Who's right? God's right. And what does God prescribe? Looking at Acts 15 as our starting point and digging into the whole council of scripture, God prescribes Presbyterianism for how to run the church and how to govern his church. And that, I mean, I think that book makes the definitive, though very technical case from a historical perspective. You're going to have to send me a link of that one. because I, I, I will, man. That's a great book. You need to have that in your <laughs> library. You need to read yeah. it. But okay. So what is its influence and significance in the world today? Well, how will it have an influence? Only if it's read and taught. And if you're a Presbyterian church member, and certainly if you're an officer in a Presbyterian church, make sure that it's being taught in your church. If you're a member, demand it from your pastors. If you're an officer, brothers, let's teach it to our people. Let's do that because we believe it's biblical. It's going to help them to understand the Bible better and to love Jesus better. Really, I mean, that's why we have this. And so that's how it's going to be influential. If we regard it as a discipleship tool and not merely as the equivalent of a dictionary or bylaws, something to turn to, to answer particular questions as they come up, but rather this is something to teach and to be taught and to use in discipleship. It just needs to be studied and read closely. I, I've been, I've been really excited to see, I, I think, a reawakening of interest in the Confession of Faith over these past few years. I, I remember the evening I was sitting in my dungeon of a basement in West Philly and reading the Westminster Standards for the very first time. It was like somebody put an oxygen mask on my face and, and my eyes opened and I said, yeah, yeah, this, this is putting into words what I believe the Apostle John and the Apostle Paul are, are saying in the power of the Spirit. This is putting into words. Everything's coming into place. Everything's fitting together together now. Let's introduce more people to that. I think that's a great thing. Is it going to have uh, an influence more broadly in society? You know, I, I don't think this is something that, you know, we're going to try to get serialized in the local newspaper or or get broadcast on PBS or Fox News or CNN or, you know, primetime, you know, ABC Family or something in a sitcom. But it is something that should affect how we engage in evangelism and conversations with our friends, with our neighbors, maybe less so the confession at least directly, and more so the catechisms, which are al almost always published together. They, they should be our go-to list of questions and answers for frequently asked questions about the Christian faith. And so those are the ways that it can influence society. But I, I do think that in the wake of the Young Restless and Reform movement, which I know has a lot of flaws, but really did a lot of good too, we see one of the greatest influences of the theology of the Westminster Confession of Faith. And that is that big God theology, that God is sovereign 
sovereign over every square inch of what he's created, that he's in control, that all things terminate upon him, and he is good, and he is a God of grace. That is clearly communicated in the Westminster Confession of Faith. I think that has influenced for much good modern evangelicalism, and I hope that influence increases and does not wane in the years ahead. Listen, for those out there, you know, considering, you know, to support me with buying me a coffee, go ahead and hit <laughs> that subscribe button, hit the bell notification. You know, I'm trying new things. So if you see something like, hey, it's always good to experiment at this young stage of my game. You know, that the, the channel is young and this is where I'm testing new things out, like riding the skateboard to seminary, maybe. <laughs> Later on, I'll get a Camry. You know, you know what I mean? You're moving on up. <laughs> <laughs> so, so you know what I mean? So go ahead and support the show by hitting the subscribe and like button, sharing this link and other videos. I got five seasons, you know, and it's all coming from a Hispanic, a person interested in Presbyterianism, trying to share it with the world, you know, talking with bigger people that God surprises me sometimes. But, you know, with the people I talk to, it's, it's amazing. But go ahead and support me that way. Another way you could support me is by go ahead and visiting my store. Is I, I sell t-shirts and other things. So go ahead and scan this QR code and it'll take you to my store, uh, Threads by Jesse. And you go ahead and cop yourself a couple of shirts. Might as well. I have some for the kids, some for the wifey, some for the babies. You know what I mean? So go ahead and support me in this way, it goes a long way, especially if you're the kind of person that loves to support small people, small businesses, small ministries, you know, startups. If you're an entrepreneur and you're listening, you want to support a startup, go ahead and contact me on Twitter at the Chicano Knox and let's talk. Until then, let's go ahead and continuing chasing after that kingdom. Let's continue planting the flags of Jesus until he comes back and let's continue making money much of Jesus every single day. God bless you. Grace and peace. See ya.